Okay, Yasir, welcome and uh, thanks for continuing. Uh, over yeah, to you now. Yeah, thank you to Ayan and uh, to the audience. I mean, for showing uh, you know uh, interest in, in me continuing with this colloquium, which went really uh, a lot over time last time. I think um, because of the way you know uh, pedagogical way that I adopted. But um, uh, thank you for the enthusiasm. So uh, I'll continue from there. So isn't I see many students also in the audience. I mean, if you feel that you you know you're not catching up at some point, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. And uh, I'll be happy if I can take you as far as I can. So um, in the last thing, uh, I introduced you to the basics of, you know, uh, quantum spin liquids, uh, why they are, you know, so special in the sense they fall outside of the Landau paradigm of symmetry breaking, you know, so you cannot use uh, conventional local order parameters to uh, characterize them. And um, the, the fact is that uh, although there are hundreds and thousands of different kinds of spin liquids, uh, all of them have the same symmetries, right? So the way you would, for example, distinguish two crystals is, you know, doing some XRD or, you know, looking at the crystal structure and, you know, you will have some different pattern of arrangement of atoms, um, you know, and, and that'll help you distinguish, you know, whether it's a cubic crystal or it is, you know, a body centered, face centered, and, you know, looking at the positions of atoms. However, uh, the, the there are some very internal orders in quantum spin liquids, but they cannot be probed so simply, you know, just by taking positions of atoms. And we saw that these are, you know, dynamical symmetries associated with the way, uh, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the spins are entangled at very long distances. And uh, quantum spin liquids, although there are hundreds and thousands of them, you cannot distinguish them by looking at their, you know, uh, different symmetries of space groups or, you know, time. A reversal and like that. So uh, you need another language actually to uh, describe, uh, you know, spin liquids. And the natural language actually that has come out over the, you know, uh, uh, decades is that the natural degrees of freedom in which you should look at is not directly the spins, but rather you must, you know, rewrite the spin operators in terms of fermions. Okay. And so you can rewrite the spin operators as a bilinear of certain complex fermions. Uh, whose creation and annihilation operators are denoted as F dagger and F. Uh, and uh, these are called as spin-on operators. And you will see why, you know, we do it. Uh, there is an experimental, you know, backing to this in at least in one dimension. And the thing that is, the, that is there is that although the, the Hilbert space of the original spin model is C2, uh, you know, uh, the Hilbert space of the enlarged, uh, you know, the enlarged Hilbert space of the fermionic representation is four dimensional. And uh, this basically implies that there are additional internal symmetries. That is, you can play around with some, you know, uh, rotating these F, F dagger operators, you can mix them around so that the left-hand side remains unchanged, okay? And the simplest you can see is already that if you, you know, rotate these uh, F operators by some phase, you know, e to the power i theta. And it's straightforward two line algebra to see that nothing will happen to the right-hand side. Uh, uh, you know, it'll cancel out and, and the spin operator, every component will remain unchanged. So besides the usual, you know, um, uh, symmetries of on the lattice, like, you know, rotations, reflections, translations, global spin rotation, you have some additional symmetry. And uh, actually the, 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 the set of symmetries you gain is larger than U1. You can also do a particle hole transformation. Okay, and, uh, and since this doesn't commute with this U1, you can actually, you know, prefix and suffix it to, you know, the gauge transformation around it. And uh, you see that the most general transformation you can do to the spin-ons is actually uh, uh, an SU2 transformation. And at every site on the lattice, you can do this. It's a local transformation. Independently, you can do it on every site and it keeps the left-hand side unchanged, okay? So this is an SU2 gate symmetry. So there's a subscript, that's why I've put an SU2, you know, subscript key, uh, which you gain when you go into the fermionic representation in addition to the usual symmetries of, you know, translating by one lattice constant or, you know, n times the lattice constant or, you know, time reversal uh, or, you know, other space group symmetries that you have, point group symmetries and all of that. So the thing that, uh, that then happens is that uh, this additional gauge redundancy uh, that is there in spin-on space, not in spin space, in spin-on space, means that you acquire some degree of freedom as to how, you know, when you have these physical lattice symmetries or spin symmetries, how they act in the spin-on Hilbert space. Okay, so earlier what you required was that when you do such, when you, when you, when you, when you act uh, by some physical, you know, 90 degree rotation symmetry of a square lattice or like that, the thing should remain unchanged. 
now you say that I will allow the things to change because I have additional symmetry at hand which can actually undo the change. So the, so the symmetry of the theory then becomes the physical space-time operations supplemented by gauge transformations, okay? So to every physical space group, you know, symmetry or time reversal, you then define a gauge transformation, you know, which can always undo that change. So in mathematical terms, this is what you would say that, that, that basically physical symmetries act projectively in the spin on Hilbert space, that is up to a phase factor, okay? Now, there are two ways, that, you know, you can, uh, you can have this implementation. So if you have a linear, for example, th there is a space-time, you know, uh, symmetry, which is fine, but then there's also spin rotation. So when spin rotations act linearly in the Hilbert space, you give rise to these, what are called a symmetric spin liquids, the usual spin liquids, uh, you know, uh, that uh, most of the people have studied. Whereas when SU2 spin rotations, for example, for the case of spin one half, are also implemented projectively, which was actually realized only about, let's say, you know, a few years back, you land up with some exotic kinds of Majorana spin liquids. And what I'm going to discuss most is the right-hand side, the symmetric spin liquids. They are the more easier ones to go. So the thing is that when you rewrite spins in terms of fermions, and you saw that, you know, if you were dealing with a Heisenberg model, which involves the dot product of two spin operators, say SI dot SJ, and each spin operator is a bilinear in the fermions, okay? So when you plug that in, you get four fermion interaction terms. Okay. So you, you, you start with already a complicated model, but you land up with an even more complicated model and it's of no use. So what people do is to typically have some kind of a non-interacting or a mean field starting point. So you can decouple these four fermion interaction terms, which involve psi dagger psi, psi dagger psi into the, you know, the, the, the particle particle channel and the particle whole channel. So you can take expectation values of you know f dagger f, which are like the hopping terms, okay? So uh, you have these hopping, or f dagger f dagger, which are like the pairing terms, right? And then you land up with a quadratic Hamiltonian. So in a, in a convenient uh, you know uh, basis, it's just written as you know psi dagger, uh, you know at psi i psi j, with some transition matrix elements u i j, which are simply just composed of hoppings and pairings. And then of course you uh, you must enforce the one fermion per side constraint because you've enlarged the Hilbert space, you know in the fermionic representation, and that is done by the Lagrange multiplier terms. So what happens is that the, it's very difficult to actually classify, uh, you know, quantum many body wave functions which are interacting. So what people have done is to start from a non-interacting mean field, you know, uh, ansatz or picture, and then try to classify all possible non-interacting theories. So all possible quadratic spin on Hamiltonians. And uh, this UIJ matrices are simply just, you know, your, a linear combination of Pauli matrices, tau mu I've adopted for the Pauli, you know, uh, matrix. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, um, I times uh, I2, the identity, and then the standard sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. Uh, and uh, the thing is that uh, you have these um, expectation values of the, you know, of the hoppings, which are these zeta between site I and site J, the hopping amplitudes, uh, and you have the pairing amplitudes, okay? So you have a complex hopping and a complex pairing, and this is compactly written in terms of this, and this can be expanded in a Pauli basis, uh, which is here. So the, the moment you specify all possible hoppings with their phases and their amplitudes and all the lattice links and the pairings, you completely specify uh, the, the, the ansatzer, okay? So the thing is that um, every ansatzer has a special property in a sense, you can define a set of gauge transformations, which actually keeps the ansatzer absolutely invariant, okay? And this is called as an invariant gauge group. This is actually completely different from, from the gauge group that is defined here. So here, when I say there's an SU2 gauge transformation, this is a high energy gauge group. Uh, this is basically dependent on how you wish to rewrite your spin in terms of fermions. You can also define a U1 fractionalization scheme, Z2 fractionalization schemes, or you know SU2 as here. This is a low energy property, okay? It, it basically tells you what is the nature of low energy excitations uh, you know, um, uh, that can emerge uh, uh, from the ground state. And- uh, Sorry, uh, just asking something, what you mean by the invariant gauge group is simply uh, because the mean field UIJ will break part of the gauge symmetry and it will break yeah. it to a subgroup. You mean no, that- No, no, uh, so, so, no, 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 so, 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 so there, there is confusion. So the thing is that this, this high energy gauge group I defined SU2 can never be broken. That, that is a high energy gauge group defined at the lattice scale. Okay, at the scale of the exchange interaction. Oh, that is fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah but the, I mean, this yeah. gauge group, that is the invariant gauge group, this is, this of course, of course can be broken. So you can have an SU2 theory and then you can, you know, for example, condense these fermions 
via some anderson higgs mechanism or you can gap them out via chern simons terms and you can lower the gauge group yes so this of course can be modified depending on you know adding various terms to the answer the so this invariant yeah i'm is, just asking if yeah. is it similar to what high energy physicists call spontaneous gate symmetry breaking because uh, it's well, uh, it's essentially uh, essentially u is like a higgs field right yeah. and uh, and and then that is going to break uh, break the gauge group and give mass to the some of the fermions yeah and keep some of the fermions massless for example That's some right. of the spin on yeah. thing Yeah, that's right. So, so yes. So, in the way you explained me, that is similar to that. Hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, the, the symmetry, as a such, of the theory is unbroken. So, the water entities, the operator water entities, still have this uh, SU two gate symmetry, but the but the physical states are not uh, in representations of uh, or have, uh, of course, uh, show the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Indeed, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, So, so the thing is that there is one approach that you can do this low effect, uh, you know, uh, theory, uh, low energy effective theory. The other is that you can also go beyond mean field uh, and add fluctuations by actually doing projections. So the point is that you must remove unphysical states, states which so, have no, you know, yes, sir, zero. Yes, yeah. sir. Just a, a quick clarification, very quick. The lambdas sure. that are sitting here are essentially the Lagrange multiplier lambdas, right? Which That's are, right, yes. Which are related to the uh, to the uh abricots of uh, which are related to the abricots of lambdas but well, yes so what abricots of did had this e to the power minus lambda and he put lambda to infinity to project out the unphysical states okay okay yes so this, yes. these lambdas are complex chemical potentials that's how i should the, think about that's absolutely right they are complex chemical potentials they involve either the diagonal term which is the usual chemical potential uh, or right. also on site pairing so you know fi okay. up fi down Like that, okay. f dagger i, you know, up f dagger i down, yes, and that's so, a complex thing. So you can have real pairing or complex, or you know, imaginary pairing as well as the chemical potential. How good is the starting point? And the sense that when you are writing this starting point out, you are restricting yourself to a quadratic theory. Yeah. So the so the so the hope is that of course a quadratic theory has no resemblance to the actual physical spin Hamiltonian because that was right. like, that was interacting without any small parameter. Yes. Right. Yes, and this is a completely uh, non-interacting theory, and there is no small parameter in which you can include these fluctuations beyond mean field. That's so correct. So the trouble is then is that uh, the way to implement the, so there are two parts to the fluctuations. One is the fluctuations in the lambda, the time dependence of the lambda, the chemical right. potential, which enforces the one fermion per side constraint. Right. That is what you call as the temporal component of the gauge field, right? Okay. And then you have the uijs, and they have their That is uij e to the power i aij, which are the spatial components of the gauge fields. Right, right. So you must include fluctuations of both parts exactly to go back to the original thing. And of course, that's impossible to do. If you did of that, course. you would have solved the quantum many-body problem exactly. Exactly. Yes. So what people do is that they they do what is called as a Gertzwiller projection. So you take the mean field. So this is the quadratic Hamiltonian. You can diagonalize it via Bogoliubov transformation. You put it in a computer. You know, I mean, every student can do that. I mean, you just you get the spectrum and you get the eigenvectors, and you can do what is called as a Gertzwiller projection. So it's, you simply apply this uh, this this operation where you try to project out those states which have either unphysical state which have zero spin, or which have you know. Uh, uh, so yeah, two kinds of zero spin states: up down or you know empty sites. And the moment you do that. That means that you have, and fortunately, it's possible to do this exactly numerically in a Monte Carlo sampling. So you only propose those configurations, you know, uh, which which satisfy the one fermion per side constraint. You can actually project uh, out these states, and that means you incorporate the fluctuations of the temporal component of the gauge field exactly, and that takes you beyond mean field. But there is nothing known about analytically about the properties of this projector till date. Okay, it it it, it is like. Sorry, a Yeah, see, I'm really lost here. So this uh, microscopic wave function before the projection is a wave function of the spinons, or right? It's of the uh, spinons. Uh, it, it resides uh, in an incorrect Hilbert space because the Hilbert space right. is four-dimensional. Yeah, and then you must. And one this. aspect of it would be to just uh, project into the gauge invariant uh, wave functions, or I don't understand. Yeah, what, so what, so, what so is, what you must do is to is to so the original spin. If you take a spin one half, right? That is so the Hilbert space is either up or down, right? Mm. but now you have extra fake states right which are which are either you know ah, up okay. down like w which, of, which, have, 
doubly occupied or empty, which have spin zero, and you must remove them. And fortunately, it's possible to do this exactly numerically uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Monte Carlo scheme, right? So when you, uh, so the thing is that uh, this is called as a Goodwiller projection. And uh, but this is uh, you... not really moving out the gauge. Uh, uh, gauge. Uh, uh, this is not really moving uh, removing gauge because the spin zero and spin two also is gauge invariant, right? I mean, it's just that. It's no, no. The, 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 see, the point is that this SU two gauge symmetry acts in this enlarged Hilbert space. So when you kill this, uh, these extra, you know, fake states, you know, uh, which, which, have, uh, which are unphysical, which have spin zero, you are basically no longer operating in this enlarged Hilbert space. You're operating in the original, you have a bona fide, uh, you know, spin wave function, which resides in the correct Hilbert space. And that, that you must do, because otherwise uh, there is no legitimacy to your, to your, to your approach. Uh, because uh, you, 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 the mean field here is very strange. The mean field, first of all, you know, usual mean field, you don't, you don't change the Hilbert space. Here, you've completely changed it. And the second thing is that this also in induces interactions between the spin-ons. So uh, the, 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 the catch psi naught is actually just a free fermion, you know, wave function. And the, what you've done by doing projection is to incorporate fluctuations, you know, of the gauge field and th that mediates interactions between these spin-ons. So you have uh, uh, actually a many body wave function. You have a correlated wave function uh, after projection. And uh, so what people know in general, most cases is to do this kind of projection to actually incorporate the fluctuations of the temporal component and go beyond mean field. But it's- the only NJ very... is a quadratic operator, right? And two minus NJ, so you're introducing- Yeah, NJ, NJ is just the number operator, right? This is the number operator. Yeah, and, uh, it's just FI dagger. And then, know, FI, yeah. So you're converting the projection now converts the free theory to an interacting theory. It converts into an interacting theory. The resulting wave function is actually a correlated, it's a strongly correlated state. And uh, that is, that uh, takes you there beyond is, uh, state. Yeah, and is there some variational parameters in this original wave function that- Oh, sure, of have course. To so, so, yeah, sure, sure. So these, yeah, so these hopping amplitudes and the pairing amplitude serve as variational parameters. And uh, I, I'll uh -huh. show you subsequently, you know, uh, how they come about, yeah. Uh, thanks. So, okay. so that's how people go, okay. So now let's come back to a little more physical, uh, you know, picture about about these. So the the, the thing is that, um, yeah. So so the so the point is that in one dimension, okay, if you take a simple, you know, nail state, right? So you have up, down, up, down, up, down like that, and you start, you create one, you reverse one spin, which is shown in this oval here, right? So you disturb that state. Now I told you that the Heisenberg model is actually quite tricky. If you write it, not just in Cartesian components as you know, Sx times Sx plus Sy times Sy plus Sz times Sz, but rather you rewrite the Sx times Sx plus Sy times Sy in terms of ladder operators, which all of uh, you know the students have studied uh, in terms of S plus minus operators. Uh, these S plus minus operators actually are what introduces fluctuations or zero point oscillations into the system they actually wreak havoc on this type of ground state. So what they do is that, let's start from a state in which you have one reverse spin, right? And you have this S plus S minus. Take the spin to adjacent to it on the right, right? And you apply it with, you know, say, let's call this side I, let's call this side J, and apply it with SI uh, plus SJ minus, sorry, SI minus SJ plus. What will happen? This spin will become down and this spin will become up, okay? And you land up with a state shown below here, okay? Then you do it again. You can carry on this operation. You know, you can keep on applying uh, the Hamiltonian, which involves these S plus minus terms. And you will see that every time you go to the right of it, this will reverse and you will move uh, these set of parallel, you know, uh, spins more to the right. So what you ultimately land up with is actually two pairs of these reverse spins, which are like domain walls, you know, they are like solid arms, okay? And in between this, you have perfect antiferromagnetic order. To the left of it, in between, and to the right of it. So these dim, so these act like these domain walls, and the only difference between the antiferromagnetic order inside and outside is simply the fact that what you call a sublattice I and J is just interchanged. Okay, so you have this kind of a you know they have they are defaced. So and then each so since originally when you flipped one spin. Uh, you know, reversed it. It's, let's say it was spin one half. And when you reversed it, that the delta SZ was actually one. So you had a spin one excitation, which is now dissociated into two equivalent defects, right? And each of them carries spin one half. 
So this is a rough, very rough hand-waving picture, which is absolutely not correct in the sense, in the strict sense, because in one dimension, as I told you earlier, in the previous part, there is no long-range antiferromagnetic order. There cannot be. And simply because of these plus-minus terms. And you must remember that these, the effect of these plus-minus terms, there is no small parameter in the Hamiltonian in which you can say this is parametrically small. Okay. Uh, there, there is no control parameter. So what they can do is to actually, you know, completely uh, destroy your long range order. Indeed, this is what happens. In one dimension, this picture is completely wrong, what I told you. It's a good hand-waving argument to get you acquainted with, you know, and these domain walls are actually what are called as spin-ons. So in a more realistic picture, uh, what you do is that, uh, since you know there is no long range, you know, uh, antiferromagnetic order, you can as well assume an RVP picture where you, where you pair these, you know, spin one halves into singlets. Okay, you have these singlets. And then what happens is that you can break one of these singlets into a triplet excitation, you know, which carries spin one. So these are two spin one halves, which are parallel and they're like a triplet excitation. And then again, you can apply these S plus minus operators. And the effect is basically to interchange these empty and these singlet sites, you know. So what they'll do is that they'll move this, 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 uh, this spin far away from this original guy, you know, with which it was originally paired and created. And then you land up with actually, you know, again, a similar picture that you have singlets in between uh, on either side, and you have these kind of, you know, isolated spin one halves, which are called spin-ons, okay? So what you've done is that you've broken up an original spin one excitation into actually two spin one halves. So the natural elementary excitations of a 1D Heisenberg antiferromagnet are not in terms of spins, but in terms of these spin one half quasi particles. So what you say is that the spin one, the original magnon, has actually fractionalized into two spin one halves, okay? Which are, which are then, you know, located, uh, you know, which have to be created in pairs, but they are, you know, just far apart and, you know, they're isolated excitations. And this was a very hand-waving way I showed you, you know, and this is the reason why people originally re-expressed the spin operators in terms of spin one half, uh, you know, spin on operators because they, 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 realize, they realize that the natural language of describing a 1D Heisenberg antiferromagnet is not you know, uh, spins, but rather spin-ons, which are the elementary excitations. And this is where uh, you know, the picture completely changes from that of a conventional magnet. The, the excitation of a conventional magnet is integer spin. You know? It's a magnon spin one. And uh, a rigorous proof of the fact that spin-ons really exist in 1D was actually given uh, in early 80s by Fadiyev and Takhtajan uh, in the seminal paper, what is the spin of a spin wave uh, using methods of Bethe Ansar's, uh, you know, really elaborate uh, mathematics and uh, remains one of the most uh, complicated papers, you know. Um, but this is an exact analytical result that spin-ons exist in 1D, uh, you know. And uh, the point is that they have also been observed in experiments. So uh, uh, in uh, you know around 2013 and, uh, and around that time, uh, people took quasi one dimensional systems and did neutron scattering, uh, and uh, they matched the neutron you know scattering profile you know in, in uh, so which, which basically maps the uh, the energy transfer as a function of wave vector, and they saw two propagating modes you know in opposite directions, and uh, this is the picture shown here of a neutron scattering uh, result based on KCUF3 compound, which was a, an, a, a closest realization of a spin one half, uh, you know, a Heisenberg antiferromagnet in 1D. Uh, and you saw these two, you know, uh, propagating modes of spin-ons. And here is the comparison with the exact result due to Bethe answers. And you see the degree of overlap, you know, in both the spectral weight, you know, in the, in the, in the two spin-on excitation and the multi-spin-on continuum higher above that, as well as, you know, um, the, the, the propagating uh, modes. And uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a similar paper using another, uh, you know, uh, system, uh, Henrik Renault and, and company Martin Morigal uh, also observed the, the existence of spin-ons in, you know, here they show the, uh, the, the dispersing branch in experiment versus the theoretical result due to Bethe Ansatz. Uh, and it was remarkable to see that, you know, uh, they could actually decipher how much of the spectral weight is considered in two spin-on states. And, you know, by considering multi, how much of, you know, uh, uh, the fact is that, uh, you know, how, how much multi-spin-on states you need to consider to actually saturate the total spectral weight. So these were really remarkable experiments which were done uh, to show the existence of these fractionalized excitations. So an elementary spin-1 excitation has broken up into two spin-1 halves. 
So, okay. So with this, um, uh, yeah, yes, sir, can I ask a uh, yeah, sure, question? please. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, can you can you remind us? Um, um, is are these uh, spin half excitations actually the thing that is responsible for the long range sort of nature of the spin spin correlation function in the one D Heisenberg antiferromagnet? Yeah, so it is ultimately yeah. So ultimately, these are the degrees of freedom. Uh, so that that one must consider. In the, so when you calculate the properties of the correlation functions in the Bethe ansatz, the the you are talking about the critical behavior of a spin one and a half pi. Yes, exactly. Chain, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This ultimately comes from this. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know the argument, or do you remember the argument behind this? Mm, not at the top of my head. No. Okay. okay. I have to look through it. No. Okay, that was I just. Know, a, uh, yeah, yeah. That was just a doubt. I mean, yeah. Okay, so okay, so now beyond one dimension, the existence of spin-ons actually plagued with a lot of doubt. So this is some of the most hottest pursued areas in uh, in modern condensed matter physics is whether this fractionalization can exist in two dimensions, so in like in systems rolled in the form of sheets, or in three dimensions. You know, and this is a really controversial ground, and there is the you know everyone has their own opinion you know what they have seen in neutron scattering and you know there are counter opinions to it and uh, so yes sir, yeah, yes, sir a, quick, a quick question what about yeah. what about weakly coupled chains Do we know? Weakly, so so the systems that people studied were actually quasi one dimensional i mean in the sense that uh, okay. you know okay. the observation so of weakly coupled gap, chain. yeah weakly okay. coupled chains so there is no strictly okay. 1d system you know yeah sure so these these are all have perpendicular couplings which are say Few orders of magnitude, maybe smaller, so like that. So the sure. thing is that I mean, yeah. um, uh, one example of a spin liquid which has really come into prominence both experimentally as well as theoretically is what is called as a U1 Dirac spin liquid. So this has been argued to be the quintessential, say, mother of all spin liquids. And uh, there are various uh, experimental systems where the physics has now been, you know, ascribed to such a spin liquid to observe physics, you know. As well as theoretically, there are now uh, models where we know spin liquids exist, and the nature has been, you know, deciphered to be that of uh, of this kind. So what what this is basically is that you know, I uh, as Ian was uh, mentioning, uh, what uh, can you give some concrete example of this ansatz the UIJ, right? So the simplest example is given by just such a quadratic Hamiltonian. You just have spinons which are hopping from site I to site J, with some hopping amplitude, you know, amplitude Tij. Whose sign structure is just adjusted in such a way that it gives rise to some kind of a U1 gauge flux, some gauge magnetic flux threading through the plaquettes. You know, so take a square, right, and you can adjust these uh, these hop phases of these hoppings uh, in such a way that you have some five flux, you know, going through it. Say if you take a triangular lattice, right, uh, you can put a flux in a pattern uh, where you have five flux through every up triangle and zero through down. Or say in a Kagome lattice, you know, um, where you can have zero flux through triangles or pi flux through hexagons, uh, you just need to smartly choose the sign structures to give rise. And what all these flux patterns have in common is that if you diagonalize the Hamiltonian and plot the spectrum, you have the observation that there are Dirac cones in it. Okay, so there are two say Dirac cones per spin species here, uh, for example. Now this makes this really tricky because what happens is that uh, uh, the, so for all these U1 Dirac spin liquids defined on what, whatever kind of a lattice, in the low energy limit, you know, in the long wavelength limit, the infrared limit, they're described by what is called as quantum electrodynamics in two plus one dimensions. It's called QED3, okay? And that is their effective low energy theory in terms of which they are, you know, uh, they are explained. So, so the effective Lagrangian simply consists of, you know, Dirac fermions, which are two component here. So two component, you know, uh, matter fields, uh, fermion fields, uh, which are minimally coupled to a U1 dynamical gauge field, okay? And this index I just refers to the flavors. So there are four flavors of Dirac, you know, fermions, and they're coupled to say an emergent photon or a U1 gauge field. So those of you who are master students and, you know, uh, who would be doing course in, you know, field theory would have studied this Lagrangian. And then you have the standard Maxwell term for the gauge field, you know, uh, where this is just the dimension of mass. So all Dirac spin liquids are described in the continuum limit by such a Lagrangian. Now, this is where the complications begin. So what do we know about such a Lagrangian? So 
the original discussions on the U1 Dirac spin liquid was started actually, you know, there's a beautiful review by Patrick Lee, Nagaosa, and Wen in reviews of modern physics. They were originally proposed in the context of high TC cube rates as, you know, candidates to describe the pseudo gap regime. And ultimately, when the field of frustrated magnetism grew on its own, you know, uh, people realized that it can exist, you know, uh, also as ground states of certain, uh, you know, uh, spin Hamiltonians. So the thing is that the problem comes is that when you have these, um, uh, when you have such a QED3 theory, uh, the questions arise naturally about the stability of such a, such a theory, whether there are terms uh, which can drive the theory to strong coupling and, you know, uh, what is the ultimate fate. Uh, so but when you have very large number of fermion flavors, so going to infinity, all gauge fluctuations are suppressed, okay, and most of the perturbations become irrelevant. But as you decrease the fermion number and you come to the physically, uh, you know, um, uh, required case of four, you know, four flavors, uh, it's still an open question. Actually, uh, there is some numerical evidence that the theory is stable, uh, but there is, uh, st you know, um, still uh, some some things to do. So people initially grappled with the question whether such algebraic spin liquids, because their spin-spin correlations decay algebraically. So that's how also you want Dirac spin liquids are called, uh, you know. Uh, whether they can actually be exist as real physical, uh, you know, spin states, ground states of, you know, spin Hamiltonians. So the discussion started in these papers by Hermely, Senthil, and Fisher, and uh, they, they, you know, reiterated that this compact QED3 has a deconfined phase for a large number of fermion fields. The monopole fluctuations are irrelevant. I will come to this in more detail in the next slide. And when you generalize the spin symmetry from SU2 to SUN, uh, you have, uh, you know, stability is guaranteed. And um, there were a number of papers then, but there was a very little understanding still about, you know, how stable they could be on different lattices. So, uh, uh, a stupid question, Yasser. So, sure, what yeah. do you mean by the stability here? I mean, whether uh, you whether you have gapless excitations or not, I don't quite get that. Uh, what do you mean? So, what by I stability? mean by stability? Okay, so what I mean by stability is consider this Lagrangian right here, right? So, the question is that how? So, there's this work on, you know, uh, scale invariance of QED three. And the relevance of uh, of basically, you know, so, so the point is that when you decrease the number of fermion flavors, right? At what is a critical number of fermion flavors uh, at which the theory, the, you know, the, the, the theory flows to a stable critical fixed point in the IR limit, okay? So the thing is that well, suppose- You mean uh, whether the theory, I mean, I mean, it will always either flow to a some, uh, some IR fixed point or it will be gapped or I mean, or confined. No. Uh, but you mean whether the point, whether it is free, right? That is what you probably ask for. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whether, yeah, the, yeah. whether it's a trivial fixed point or not. Whether it's a trivial fixed point, there is a stable okay. critical fixed point to which it flows. So you can show that that when, when the energy scale is less than E square, actually the, the theory, uh, even in the case of four, four, there are four flavors of, you know, Dirac fermions flows to uh, so the, the thing is that to take into account gauge fluctuation, right? And the theory yeah. so has gauge been shown fluctuation is actually an irrelevant operator, but the question is whether it becomes relevant in the infrared. Whether it becomes relevant as the number of fermion flavors decreases. I understand. Uh, that. I understand. So, so, the question is so about then, whether now, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, okay. Let me come to this in the next slide. Okay, let me go to this in more detail. So the thing is that there is mounting numerical evidence uh, on certain lattices, uh, Hamiltonian, say the Kagome lattice or the triangular lattice. Uh, for spin one half Heisenberg antiferromagnets, uh, uh, showing that the U1 Dirac spin liquid has been remarkably stable towards various kinds of perturbations. So perturbations towards chiral symmetry breaking, perturbations towards you know lowering of its gauge structure to Z2 via Anderson-Higgs mechanism, and this is where uh, most of my work during PhD uh, was focused on. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, recently there's a lot of density matrix renormalization group study in a beautiful work that appeared in TRX showing signatures of Dirac cones, you know, uh, in this Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And then there is a work uh, also showing entanglement signatures of emergent Dirac fermions, you know. And similarly on the triangular lattice, um, uh, we had our uh, first paper, you know, uh, where we showed that the Dirac spin liquid can be stable to a very large class of perturbations, okay. So, so uh, uh, Yasir, I just wanted to ask to get a clarification. So now, if some operators become relevant in the infrared, and many of them can also break uh, translation and also this emergent Lorentz symmetry, right? I mean, what? Yeah, so yeah, I'm coming to that, precisely coming to that question now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, so the thing is that uh, there is further evidence regarding transformation. So, so the further evidence regarding that's a Dirac spin liquid 
because of the fact that you know when when you perturb these hamiltonians with certain chirality terms the system the dirac spin liquid naturally should flow to a kind of a chiral spin liquid where you have the churn simons term that appears and uh, the point is that um, there are these two beautiful papers in high energy physics which in the group of you know rajamani narayanan uh, showing uh, the fact that 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 qed3 you know flows to a stable critical phase even in the small fermion number so in the absence of actually symmetry lowering perturbations or monopoles so let me come to now um, i think in in the next slide uh, in in great detail to this but so, uh, uh, we could always question this papers because i think they assume that the the relativistic symmetry is not broken yeah yeah of course in of course, case, of course. you could always in in few break relativistic symmetry then obviously you, you can still have uh, in principle uh relevant operators uh, of course of course right. that, that's absolutely correct so 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 the thing is that in the absence of symmetry lowering perturbation that's why i wrote there so uh, it was yeah, in the absence of symmetry lowering perturbation in the absence of monopoles in that case you can show that there Sorry, is numerical evidence absence of monopoles again you mean uh, so this is okay what... so, so so shall i come to this in the next slide i'll explain ah, okay. to this to you in, in in detail so the u1 dirac spin liquid has been argued from a lot of numerical point you know uh, studies uh, using various numerical methods which go beyond mean field in different ways as well as th there's a lot of amounting experimental evidence now uh, that that you know the, the kagome heisenberg antiferromagnet which is realized in this system um as well as in other you know in, uh, niobium oxides and uh, system proposed by patrick lee you know a uh, long studied uh, tas2 the dirac spin liquids appear to be relevant you know uh, in explaining the low temperature thermodynamics uh, and they show all the signatures you know so uh, that should be expected of a dirac spin liquid so what what one needs now is a deeper and a more rigorous understanding of monopoles of the u1 gauge field so let me come to this what 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 are these monopoles that are you know i have been talking about so the thing is that when you write qed3 you know in the long wavelength limit there is an enlarged symmetry that arises of this theory which is not there in the microscopic spin hamiltonian okay so if you look at the microscopic spin hamiltonian at the lattice scale you have the usual su2 spin rotation symmetry you know because the si dot sj you have translational symmetry and various other point group symmetries rotations reflections time reversal now the thing is that when you go into the continuum limit there is a conserved current in the theory that arises okay and this conserved current leads to a conservation you know that it basically corresponds to a conservation of total gauge magnetic flux which is called u1 top i'll tell you why so the thing is that The, the, so the corresponding conserved charge is this magnetic flux of the emergent u1 gauge field okay now this conservation of of this uh, you know um, uh, total gauge magnetic flux cannot be ascribed to any microscopic symmetry present in the original lattice spin hamiltonian okay this is an artifact of purely uh, you know this is an artifact of going into the infrared or the continuum or the long wavelength limit because when when you go in the low energy limit you are basically working in a reduced hilbert space and there are some operators which are closed in this reduced hilbert space giving rise to some local conservation laws so this is simply just a topological conservation uh, law that arises in this limit but it it has no origin in a microscopic symmetry so how do you remedy this the way you remedy this is that you allow certain tunneling events okay between different vacua or ground states with total with different total flux okay and these these tunneling events these quantum tunneling events between different vacua with different total you know uh, fluxes are basically instantonic effects there are certain points in space time and the operators okay which actually annihilate or create this 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 the or change the you know the magnetic flux in units of 2 pi are called as monopole operators okay so these are what i mean they are just a way to remedy this problem so the problem is that you went into the low energy limit you had an extra symmetry okay this symmetry uh, sorry you had an extra sort of conserved quantity this conserved quantity cannot be ascribed to any symmetry in the microscopic hamiltonian okay so you remedy this and the way you remedy this is you introduce monopoles okay which are just operators which create two pi flux or they you know annihilate two pi flux locally okay so the, what they do is that these operators uh, you know they change the uh, uh, you know uh, flux of the so they change the magnetic field you know locally at a certain point 
and this change the corresponding change in the magnetic flux is not visible at very large distances okay so now monopoles but, but there's a certain trick so unlike other physical operators these monopoles cannot be written straightforwardly you know as polynomial expressions of you know gauge fields or fermion fields okay so uh, that that's not possible but the other the good thing about them is that since they are local operators they transform as linear representations of the symmetry group now this is completely different from what happened with spin ons with spin ons they trans so, so, when lattice symmetries acted in spin on space they acted projectively okay but monopoles they do not transform like that they transform as linear representations so they they are basically what you call as integer spin representations so if you if you're familiar with the path integral formulation you would say that you know these monopoles are just points in space time surrounded by a 2 pi flux so in the case of large fermion number when all the fluctuations are suppressed you can assume this flux to be static 2 pi flux and you know uh, in in that thing in the hamiltonian formulation these are simply you know operators creating and annihilating 2 pi flux now what i mean by stability of the theory is that if you didn't have if you didn't have if, if you didn't have any matter fields okay uh, no fermion fields no dirac massless fermions you simply had the the maxwell term and you had these monopole terms now this is the famous result of polyakov that the monopole proliferation will occur it will gap out this photon and confine these gate charges okay but the moment you introduce these uh, these uh, massless dirac fermions the problem becomes really more complicated Sorry, just and, one thing. What you mean by monopole term is simply the theta term, what we call the theta e dot b term, f yeah. f theta term, right? And yeah. So the monopole, yeah. So in my context, what I mean by monopole, I explained. I mean, uh, I, 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 these are just local operators. So okay, if you want another, so there, you know, there's a state operator. Ah, so it's more like a right? John Simmons like term. That's what you mean, or what exactly? No, I mean, I mean, so 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 what happens is that so the physical picture is what I already explained that 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 you have. Uh, so that that you must in the lagrangian you are allowed to add certain terms okay which change the total gauge magnetic flux in units of 2 pi simply because this this at the microscopic level in the original spin hamiltonian you don't have any such u1 conservation law of the total gauge magnetic flux because there is no such uh, u1 oh, okay. symmetry I understand present. what the, what it is maybe it is basically okay. epsilon mu nu f mu or f mu nu yeah, yeah it is epsilon mu nu lambda do nu a lambda okay, uh, yeah, okay. So that's yeah. the conserved okay. current in the theory right okay uh, so but the yeah, problem you... is that uh, if you try to look for the microscopic symmetry which is responsible you will never find it in the spin hamiltonian so yes. this is an artifact this is an artifact of going to the infrared limit and therefore you must rectify it and the rectification means that in this lagrangian you are allowed to add terms okay that can change the flux that can that can change the total gauge magnetic flux in units of 2 pi in and the monopoles are simply operators that do that okay now yeah, the thing is that one thing i think there is a, this polyakov paper it's important whether you also keep u1 compact or non compact actually yeah so, so these, I, okay so here you are looking for i think compact u1 I'm looking at compact QED three. If you didn't have it, if you just had this L equals to summation I one to four, the first term that's non-compact four fermion flavor QED three. Okay, but I'm looking here at compact QED three. So in the presence of matter fields, the thing becomes very much more complicated, because of course at large fermion flavor number, the monopole becomes an irrelevant you know perturbation, but the what is the lower critical NF is not completely known. and it was not known actually till 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 this year okay this is when people really studied uh, okay let me come to that so the thing is that when you look at this qed3 um, you have the usual su4 flavor symmetry right so that's basically so6 here mod z2 and you have this u1 topological uh, you know uh, uh, conservation of flux that is there and in addition you had lorentz symmetry charge conjugation the usual time reversal and space reflection and these monopoles i must tell you are scalars under lorentz symmetry so they are lorentz scalars okay uh, this can be seen directly so so i and another way to see this um, you know, monopoles is via this operator state operator correspondence right so what you can do is that you can say that these monopoles are just uh, you know states of qed3 defined on a on a two sphere s2 okay with some background you know with some two pi flux so uh, so I, I, and the most relevant monopoles you can think of them as just the ground states of these dirac fermions so you 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 just fill up all the negative energy levels and all the positive energy levels are empty 
and uh, you just have the zero modes which are you know half of them you must fill to maintain gauge neutrality and uh, so that's your simplest picture of you know the monopole uh, so you can use the state operator correspondence to do that so the thing is that what people did was to you know in these uh, two papers uh, so one of the papers that really appeared very beautiful study uh, in prx from the group of you know ashwin vishwanath chongwang uh, yin chen were involved is that uh, they tried to figure out how are these microscopic symmetries of the hamiltonian embedded in this larger symmetry group okay so how would say so3 spin rotation how would time reversal how would point group symmetries be embedded in this larger group assuming that this larger group is not broken down you know uh, at the microscopic level so you can already see you know so so what people did was that they 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 looked at only the leading monopoles that is monopoles with the lowest scaling dimension okay and uh, and and they studied monopoles which transform as a vector under so6 so they form a so6 vector of course one can also consider some symmetry breaking perturbations like fermion bilinear as ryan was talking about but these are more complicated for example they form a 15 dimensional su4 edge joint uh, the fermion bilinears whereas the monopoles uh, you know they form uh, simply they they are they are a vector under so6 so for example you can form the six monopoles like um, you know in this trivial where where you, where you have these you know where you have these f operators which create a you know a fermion in a zero mode you have this uh, you know rank 2 traceless uh, this is the, the you know the rank 2 antisymmetric tensor you have the pauli matrices and at the m bare is simply you know uh, an operator which creates uh, you know a static you know two pi Uh, flux and um, you so the thing is that when you for example embed so3 spin rotation as a subgroup of so6 uh, you can have monopoles you know uh, which transform as spin singlets and uh, the other three because of the sign of i as spin triplets and the whole question then arises that on different kinds of lattices how do monopoles transform under microscopic symmetry so basically trying to figure out what are the allowed symmetry allowed monopole perturbations to the the qed3 lagrangian okay and what are their quantum numbers and this basically boils down to the question of how are microscopic symmetries embedded into the larger symmetry group okay so this was worked out uh, in this paper uh, and uh, so the remarkable result that these people reached was that if you consider a bipartite lattice okay so a lattice in which you can trivially have two sublattice nail orders so that for every spin you can have its neighbor which is in the opposite you know uh, opposite pointing so if you have a spin down you can always surround it by you know four nearest neighbors which are up so you can basically segregate the lattice into two sub lattices okay so whenever you have a bipartite lattice and the two examples are say honeycomb and square so let's say every blue dot is a spin up and every you know red dot is a spin down and you see that every blue dot has only red neighbors and every red dot has only blue neighbors so whenever you have a bipartite uh, you know system what they showed was that there is always a two pi monopole that transforms trivially under all physical symmetries so what i mean by trivially is that it transforms as the identity representation of all under all lattice symmetries and this is a allowed perturbation to qed3 okay and then the suspicion arose that this will pr- presumably drive the theory to strong coupling okay Just now one, the thing one is that clarification question when you say that what do you mean the monopole is typically located at some uh... at some uh, placket or something right i mean and yeah so uh, so so the so the monopole uh, the monopole will show up as certain uh, you know in spectroscopic measurements it will show up uh, you know with some concentrated spectral weight at some point in the brillouin zone okay so the so the monopole could be as i showed uh, uh, you know uh, uh, yeah my uh, question uh, is then how come it is invariant on the say Uh, lattice translation symmetry for example I no no on bipartite lattices you can always define a trivial monopole that is a monopole which transforms under the identity representation of all lattice symmetries yeah, you can yeah. of so course I, have I, you I, can I, have I, monopoles that transform under higher representations of so6 so nobody is denying that so you can have monopoles that transform you know more complicated representations of so6 but let's say the sim, you can always define a trivial one okay Yeah, yeah. My my only question is, uh, I mean, okay, maybe it's is uh, what you mean is the monopole operator actually not the yeah the monopole operator, not a specific or you can also define you can you can think of them as states also so by the state operator correspondence. So, so no, no. So okay, the, my so my the, conclusion was uh, very very trivial actually. So okay. essentially, you were talking of the st- okay the st- state itself the 
so basically you are basically integrating that operator over all lattice sites and then you are defining this as integrated operator already yeah I yeah think. yeah so it becomes more picture, picture is more clear in the state operator correspondence so in the state operator correspondence you would say that you know the way the monopoles transform depends both on the dirac fermions as well as the zero modes so what is happening is that see you are filling up your system up to half filling right up to the dirac cone so you have the dirac for the, the full dirac c as well as you have the zero modes right now mm -hmm. the thing is that how many zero modes do you have so in order to maintain you know the gauge neutrality that is the vanishing of the overall gauge flux you have to fill in only half of the zero modes okay and okay. since there are four flavors of fermions and you have to fill uh, half of them it's 4c2 then you can do it in six ways so the way you can think is that you have a, so you have states you know um, uh, which are which are you know filled directly with zero modes and then they are transforming under this su4 flavor symmetry okay into each other so the monopoles can also be you know thought of in the sense of states you know how to construct different simple states of dirac fermions you know uh, and and looking at the simplest one which are the ground states so you know which are the you fill up the dirac c and the, and, the, and then uh, you know you you are looking at how they are transforming how the zero modes transform under various symmetries so the thing is that i mean you can define this perturbation it's allowed okay with this trivial so monopole the question is then uh, these zero modes how did they do they ca calculate it on the by how do they find the zero modes this paper explicitly so the way they, so, so so the thing is that see it depends on how many fermion flavors you have so suppose you have four you know uh, so the, so so okay so the way you go about is like this okay so you take dirac fermions right and you put dirac fermions in a magnetic field they form landau levels right there is always a zero energy landau level okay now this is now in the zero energy landau level Uh, you that that you have a degeneracy of that level which is equal to the number of units of two pi flux you have so it is like some phi divided by two pi okay now the thing is that you must def so 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 the thing is that you must have one zero mode so every time you add a two pi flux right you add one zero mode so the thing is that the number that you have in your thing so in this case so you have four fermion flavors right so you must add four zero modes so your theory has four zero modes and the thing is that how many zero modes should you fill actually the zero modes will not affect the energetics so how many zero modes should you fill so the the that constraint is determined by the fact that you must have a vanishing of the total gauge magnetic flux okay so to maintain gauge neutrality you must always fill only half of the zero modes so it's 4c2 okay so that gives rise to six monopoles okay so so the thing is that uh, uh, so the, so the zero mode simply arise in this way i mean the way i explained i mean you know i mean because you're so cutting my, your bank no, actually was this where is this effect of the lattice coming in here that's so all. the effect of the lattice is coming in is the how are the microscopic symmetries of the of the lattice hamiltonian embedded in the larger symmetry group of so6 cross u1 mod z2 so this is of course a larger symmetry that this is this is not present at the microscopic level so suppose i say my microscopic symmetry let's take some 90 degree rotation in a square lattice how is that embedded into this okay so the question then arises for example how do i write these three uh, you know the, 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 these six monopole operators the way i do it is that you know how do you embed a spin rotation in so6 a spin rotation is so3 right so you have an so3 subgroup of the so6 group fine right? and the way you would you would embed is that you will say that i have i have i i have three monopoles which transform as a spin one vector and i have three which transform as spin singlets and these are the these are the two sets of monopoles you will get because that's the only way you can embed so3 into so6 and similarly you can do with all other symmetries and the question then arises how do monopoles transform under these microscopic symmetries okay what are their quantum numbers how are how are these embedded okay so the, the so so the way people went about these guys went about determining this is that you can also imagine another way of viewing the monopole is that so this, so the way the, so see another physical way of imagining this u1 top symmetry is the fact that if i take you know um if i take a monopole around a closed path which encloses a gauged you know a uh, charged particle this is like the berry phase that it will accumulate okay and this is the way one for example would determine the 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 quantum numbers of of say you know operations such as rotation operations 
uh, you know, uh, of, of how these, uh, what are the quantum numbers of, they say, the, the point group symmetry corresponding to rotation or, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the system. So, I mean, I don't know whether I answered your question. I mean, I'm just... Well, well, no, actually, my question was a little bit simpler, probably. So I think what you're doing is to take this integrated versions of these operators, right? And the question then is, if I act, uh, uh, the question is that how these operators are transforming under this uh, symmetries, SO6 cross U1 topological by Z2. Yeah. The, sorry, the physical, the, the physical symmetries actually, right? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, the question is simply, uh, how do you exactly go about uh, establishing this? Uh, uh, so you say, of course, that you look into this, uh, the zero modes uh, of uh, uh, the gapless modes that, that you should have, and that is establishes this. Uh, but what I'm wondering is that, uh, how do the lattice come in? I mean, this is, I mean, I mean do, if, if there's some numerical computation that you have to do here, or exactly how do you determine the zero modes and... Uh, Say on this on this specific lattice. So how does I mean the question is especially if you ask me how does the lattice enter into the zero mode calculation? Ah uh, okay okay so uh, so yeah okay so then uh, yeah okay I think uh, yeah one I yeah uh, I have I have some I, I mean some understanding of it but okay let's discuss it once I'm done with this. Okay so, fine. Okay. okay so yeah let's discuss this but I'm not totally sure whether I would be on the dot. But uh, okay, so so the so the so the broad message that these people gave was that um, uh, if the monopole, you know, the trivial monopole is also relevant in the RG sense, it could lead to instabilities of the Dirac spin liquid. Okay, and uh, the point was that ultimately made was that I mean um, uh, the DSL is likely to be unstable on bipartite lattices, and its eventual fate would be some symmetry breaking order, some some nail antiferromagnetic ordered state or some you know valence bond solid order. And the reason was that you could always continuously tune the Dirac spin liquid on such states to some special point, which has lattice or you know honeycomb lattice. They are always driven into some symmetry breaking orders. They're never stable. Whereas on the on non-bipartite lattices, those in which you cannot divide the lattice into two halves, one is only up and down, you know, you don't have two sub lattice order, which are called non-bipartite, like triangular Kagome, all the two pi monopoles, you know, that you can define that are symmetry allowed, they are actually transformed non-trivially under the physical symmetries. Okay. And in this case, therefore, QED3 could represent a potentially stable phase. And the point then was that, you know, the most relevant monopoles that you have. Uh, that I just showed you, those transforming as a vector under SO6, for example, uh, you know, they would pick, you know, some specific representation of the symmetry group. And this, I mean, would, would actually then, 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 then it completely determine the nature of the fluctuations, you know, spin, spin fluctuations. So for example, you could have a, a monopole picking a representation, for example, which would then determine the nature of spin fluctuations in a theory. So then this would show up in spectroscopic measurements as, you know, um, when, when you throw in neutrons into a system, they would show up as, you know, uh, uh, large responses at certain, you know, uh, points in the Brillouin zone at certain transfer momentums. And, and, and there could be, you know, other monopoles which transform under more higher representations of SO6, which would then manifest themselves in a different way. So each of these monopoles then, you know, determines a different nature of, of, of critical fluctuations that you have in your system. And the monopoles not only do that, they also dictate, you know, what are the proximate symmetry breaking orders that are present. So if I were to strongly perturb this Dirac spin liquid via some symmetry lowering term, you know, where would the system be driven to? What kind of a symmetry breaking state that would be? So they are pretty useful to actually characterize these quantum numbers, you know, uh, for these monopoles and look at, you know, various classes of instabilities. Uh, and, and, and this is what, uh, these two papers, that, that was one paper, and there was another paper uh, which appeared simultaneously by the same group, a unifying description of competing orders in two-dimensional quantum magnets, where they looked at the scaling dimension of monopole operators. So on a bipartite lattice, uh, you always had this trivial monopole, right? And the scaling dimension is actually, it turns out to be this. And for four fermion flavors, you see that the scaling dimension is less than three. So this operator, you know, this, this trivial monopole perturbation is actually strongly relevant. I understand that you know um, this this result, of course, numerically could change, 
uh, but the point is that it's highly unlikely that it'll it'll shoot up to a value greater than three. Okay. So it, the more, what most likely happens is that this 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 Dirac-spin liquid flows to some other chiral symmetry broken state. There's a mass term generated, or you know there is some other uh, nearby ordered state, and this is indeed what is observed. Uh, whereas if you look at a triangular lattice and you look at the simplest monopole perturbations, you know, um, and you look at the scaling dimension, the scaling dimension turns out to be say 4.32. So this means that it's irrelevant at the SU4 symmetric point. And indeed, there are also epsilon expansion studies, you know, of QED3, uh, which evaluate the the scaling dimension of of these uh, the most uh, the you know of the simplest monopole operators, turning out to be say greater than three. Of course, this is at the margins, uh, but it turns out that you know what this tells you that there is a possibility, say, on a triangular lattice, that a Dirac spin liquid could be stable at least. Uh, in the Kagome lattice, simply if you look at the simplest monopole perturbations, you know. Uh, the scaling dimension turns out to be for one of them greater than three, for the other it's you know slightly less. Uh, but nonetheless, what this shows is that as opposed to bipartite lattices, there is a strong possibility at least that non-bipartite lattices support such exotic algebraic spin liquids, and its stability is not totally you know out of question. Uh, and these are very recent results obtained again in 2020 uh, on this. And then, as I said, you know, I mean, um, different kinds of monopole determine different uh, critical fluctuations, you know, so you can have measurable characteristic signatures in, in neutron scattering experiments, for example. Uh, so you, you know, so you can figure out where do, where are the fermion bilinear responses located at which transfer momentas would you see higher signature of spectral weight. And also for the monopoles, you know, for different lattices, where will you see, you know, the, 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 the strongest signature and this is something that people have been trying to compare with experimental, you know, uh, momentum resolved uh, spectroscopic neutron scattering measurements, you know, um, like that. So yes, I mean, um, there's a lot of activity going on in this uh, in this field um, uh, of uh, of research. I mean, um, there was mounting evidence for the past decade or so that uh, that uh, Dirac spin liquids, you know, uh, uh, there was. my PhD around that time, uh, this proposition was almost ridiculed on. I mean, nobody thought that Dirac spin liquids could, you know, be really, you know, a stable phases of matter, uh, real physical, you know, uh, ground states of spin Hamiltonians. But that perception is, uh, has changed a lot now. And there's a lot of analytical work uh, that has emerged of late, uh, where at least, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, evidence that it's not a totally ridiculous thing to believe in, you know, existence of... Uh, Algebraic spin liquids, uh, which defies conventional wisdom, you know, because in this uh, you you have a U1 gauge field. The spinons remain strongly interacting down to, you know, low energies, uh, and the ratio of these uh, uh, spinon interaction energy to the you know the energy of the system is order one. So typically you would expect that at you know at uh, low energies the system you know would would open a gap or you know uh, be de destabilized. So the the existence of such states of matter you know is is beyond the let's say conventional understanding of, of that was given to us by BCS theory or, you know, uh, things. So there's a, these are exciting times, I mean, for, and there's a lot of uh, merger between different branches of physics also. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, this is what we've been working on. So there's a lot of, uh, I think, uh, things also to look outlook, you know, the, 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 to look for in the future, I mean, uh, from an experimental or a material perspective, uh, many interesting materials are now known in a mineralogical form, which are uh, possible host to quantum spin liquid behavior on, you know, geometrically perfect lattices. Um, uh, the problem that arises mostly in this is that you have a lot of chemical disorder, which acts as the ultraviolet scale, you know, and give rise to often spins. And uh, there's a lot of work going on in the experimental side to develop, you know, to mitigate this and control disorder. And the holy grail of the field is actually, you know, what people started, uh, why the field of spin liquids actually, you know, arose in the 80s was that if you dope spin liquids, you can get some, you know, uh, superconducting behavior. So can it be metallic? And on the theoretical side also, there's a lot of open questions about, you know, uh, dynamical and non-equilibrium properties of, of, of magnets. And, you know, I'm searching for Y-zones, which are like the monopoles, but for, you know, Z2 gauge fields uh, and, uh, yeah, there are a lot of open questions, I mean, um, that um, people have uh, are addressing and look forward to.
So I thank you for your attention and uh, thanks for bearing with me uh, over a long marathon. Yeah, sir, can I just ask a clarification question? Sure, please, yeah. Can I, can I just ask a clarification? Uh, so, sure. Um, the number of zero modes in the problem is dictated by the uh, the flux that is threading the, the, the plaquettes, is it? No, so, okay, so the thing is that when you, so you must thread a certain flux pattern to get the Dirac cones in the, to get the Dirac structure in the mean field spectrum. That's one point. Then right. you are at half filling. So half filling means on a lattice, you have one particle per site. So a number site, of, yes. so, so you have, uh, say, so if you have 100 sites, you have 50 up electrons, 50 down. Right. So you're half filling. And then you're half filling, you're cutting yourself right at the Dirac node, right? Okay. So uh, the thing is that how many zero modes should you have? So the thing is that if you put massless Dirac fermions, as I said, in a magnetic field, right? So you have yeah. Landau levels and you have a zero energy Landau level. Correct, also. correct, correct. Now, uh, what is the degeneracy of the zero energy, you know, Landau level? So that degeneracy is simply given by the number of flux quanta you have, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. That is phi divided by two pi. So the right. thing is that uh, that is for each fermion flavor. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you have four fermion flavors uh, and, and you have, you know, two Dirac fermions, say per spin species, uh, right. that is the counting I was adopting. And I was just, that's why I said that for NF equals four, you have right. four zero modes that you have to fill in. Right. So, uh, and then, uh, so not, not to fill in, sorry, you have four zero modes, but then you must be careful to fill only half of them half of because them. you must maintain gauge neutrality. Okay. The vanishing of the total gauge flux. So then, uh, and then, then of course you have four and you must do only two. So you have four C2, you have six ways, right? Six. Of doing it. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yes. So, I mean, uh, that is why, I mean, another way to think of this monopole operator, and maybe I'm confusing everyone more, is to think of it as a six dimensional vector. You know, you have five, one, five, two, five, three, five, four, five, mm -hmm. five, 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 six. And it transforms as, you know, as a six dimensional representation, you know? Okay of that so uh, and then anti-monopoles are simply how we should conjugate, conjugate so yeah. these things which which annihilates a uh, two pi flux so that's one way of viewing simply uh, as i said uh, just a way to remedy this, uh, this uh, yeah so that was a nice talk i really enjoyed it thank you so much yeah thank you so much for yeah. staying on and for being there right from the beginning Actually, since all, uh, since both of you are there and, and uh, appreciate, no, since both of you are there and um, I, we should talk to Shantanu also. I think it's high time we have a mini body physics course in the department. A proper. Oh, definitely. I think uh, for sure. I mean, uh, okay. I think there are. So maybe we should end the recording first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. End the recording. End the recording. Yes, please. Yeah, end the recording. I end. End the recording. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, just give me a moment. Uh, uh, I have to see, ah, okay, got it.